Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. How are you today? I'm well, Matt. I hope you're well, too. Yes, we're coming to you today on Friday, July 3rd, 2020, and today is the Feast of St. Irenaeus of Lyon, a very, very important early church father who died around the year 202, year of our Lord 202, so uh, early, very early third century, and he's an, an important church father for several reasons. He, he left us some very priceless writings, the, the most priceless being a, a work that's in several books called Against the Heresies. Mm. And he really covers at such an early time in church history, uh, by his writings, it's a testimony to the fact that the early church was absolutely Catholic. In his writings, we see the primacy of the Church of Rome, for example, uh, the, the absolute necessity of sacred tradition. So totally, his writings totally destroy the Protestant error of sola scriptura. We also see Our Lady mentioned as the new Eve, uh, the mass um, rep mentioned as the sacrifice of the new covenant. It just goes on and on. So I wanted to read a brief quote from him specifically dealing with the importance of tradition. Uh, and this is what he says in the first book, of his against the heresies. He says, the church, having received this preaching and this faith, although she is disseminated throughout the whole world, yet guarded it as if she occupied but one house. For while, for while the languages of the world are diverse, nevertheless, the authority of the tradition is one and the same. And this next part is something that we really need to hear for our times because we're seeing this fragmentation of, of the faith, uh, faith and morals throughout the world. He wrote, neither do the churches among the Germans believe otherwise or have another tradition. Can we say that today about the Germans? Unfortunately, yes. in many cases, not. <laughs> yes. uh, so he goes on nor do those among the Iberians nor among the Celts, which would be the Irish nor away in the east, nor in Egypt, nor in Libya, nor those which have been established in the central regions of the world. But just as the Son, that creature of God, is one and the same throughout the whole world, so also the preaching of the truth shines everywhere and enlightens all men who desire to come to a knowledge of the truth. And this uh, final section of this quote is also very important. It says, nor will any of the rulers in the churches, whatever his power of eloquence, teach otherwise. So he's saying mm -hmm. that the, the bishops, and he does stress throughout his writings the importance of apostolic succession, that it's vital and it's an essential component of the church. Those bishops cannot teach otherwise than what they themselves have received from the tradition. So he says, um, for no one is above the teacher. Uh, nor will he who is weak in speaking detract from the tradition. For the faith is one and the same and cannot be amplified by one who is able to say much about it, nor can it be diminished by one who can say but little. So the tradition, uh, the magisterium is not above the word of God, is not above the tradition. And that's a very important point for our times. Because since, unfortunately, since Vatican II, we've seen so much emphasis on the so-called living magisterium that they somehow are the the owners and the um, that they can do whatever they want with the tradition of the church. So, so we ask Saint Irenaeus to intercede for us and for the the leaders of the church of our day that they would return to the primacy of tradition in the church. Yes, truly a saint for our times. Yes. And uh, this week has been a really a powerhouse week of mm. a few days on the church calendar. On Monday, we had the, the glorious feast of uh, the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul, on June 29th. The following day is the commemoration of St. Paul. And then on Wednesday, we had a feast that sadly was removed from uh, the, the Novus Ordo calendar, the Feast of the Most Precious Blood. I didn't know if Brian had anything he wanted to share about that feast briefly. 
Yes, it, it's a beautiful feast, again, which comes right after the Feast of Corpus Christi last month and the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Out of that Sacred Heart flows the precious blood. So it's sort of just beautiful. The first day of the new month uh, becomes uh, this Feast of the Precious Blood. And I always find it ironic that, the, you know, the, the conciliar church, they always, oh, we, we have to imitate Protestants and make the precious blood available, even though it's dangerous to commit sacrilege because it can easily be spilled. It's unhygienic to drink out of the chalice, I mean, kind of interesting in these times. Uh, but they sort of have to promote the precious blood to make everybody look like a priest, but then they eliminate the feast actually celebrating the thing they claim they're trying to promote. Just another example to me of their pretexts when they, they claim they're doing things to add to something, they're really taking away. Uh, but yes. it's a beautiful feast, and then followed right after it by the Feast of the Visitation the next day uh, yes. of, our, of Our Lady. Yes. One, other, one thing that came to mind uh, in regard to the Feast of the Most Precious Blood, the introit for the Mass stuck out to me as particularly mm. providential this year in light of all of the civil unrest and the, the racial mm. tensions, because it's from the Book of the Apocalypse, chapter 5, and it says, this is the, the saints in heaven singing a hymn to God. Thou hast redeemed us, O Lord, in thy blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us to our God a kingdom. So this really shows that um, in Christianity and Catholicism, there is no basis for racism, and we are all one in Christ. I wrote an article about that, which is in the, uh, the July newspaper, which is now available. Those who have an e-edition subscription can access the paper. Um, so I thought that's just, it's just a very beautiful and eloquent reminder of our unity in Christ, whether regardless of our tribe or tongue or people or nation. Mm. And Christianity, Catholicism, the church is, really, is the only institution on earth that can provide that unity for mankind according to God's plan. So something else I wanted to briefly mention before we jump into our first story today, uh, it was also on July 1st, the Feast of the Most Precious Blood, that Pope, uh, Pope Benedict XVI's brother, Monsignor Georg Ratzinger, did pass away to his, uh, to his eternal reward on that day. So let us remember him in our prayers and pray for the repose of his soul. I think he was maybe 93, something like that, very old. So, mm -hmm. And as viewers probably have heard in the news, Pope Benedict, a couple weeks back, uh, did go to Germany to visit him one last time and to visit their family home in the the cemetery where their relatives are buried. So uh, we also pray for Joseph Ratzinger and, and as he grieves the loss of his brother, which I believe was his last living relative. Yes, I think so. All right. So for our first uh, news story today, we're going to do a little bit of an update on a sto the story from last week about iconoclasm, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and the cultural Marxism, the, the rioting and the tearing down of statues. Uh, this week, we have seen, or since our report uh, from last week, Friday, we have seen a couple of encouraging scenes in the news of clergy stepping up and, and going into the public square and really uh, calmly but firmly confronting the mob in one instance and in another instance exercising the uh, their priestly power and, and performing even an exorcism at the spot where the statue of Father Junipero Serra was torn down. So our first story concerns a very young priest of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. His name is Father Stephen Schumacher. And as you can see on the screen, a Catholic News Agency published a story. Uh, this would have been on s this past Saturday, June 27th. Uh, that he was out at the statue, the famous statue, the Apothoasis, I forget if I pronounced that correctly, mm. of uh, Saint Louis, King St. Louis IX in St. Louis, the famous statue that stands in, I believe it's Forest Park there, which has been there since the early 1900s. And um, since the George, uh, since the death of George Floyd and the riots and all of the mayhem that have happened since his death, you know, the statue, as you can see in the background of the photo there, has been defaced and, and graffitied and such. And uh, so this, there's a brief video we're going to play of Father Schumacher trying to 
engage the mob and teach them about some of the true history of, of the saint that they're wanting to tear down. I've already been asked questions. I'm, I'm willing to answer them. You have to listen to the answer. Okay. So, St. Louis was a man... St. Louis was a man who had authority thrust upon him. He didn't do anything to earn it. You're right. He didn't do anything to earn it. What did he do with that authority? Do you know what he did? Go down to the St. Louis Cathedral, and you'll see some of the history that St. Louis did. St. Louis was... Eventually we're taking that too, though. St. Louis... St. Louis was a man who willed to use his kingship to do good for his people. St. Louis had nothing to do with Africans, okay? Do you know who lived in? Where did he invade? Where did he invade? Do you know who lived in Tunisia in 1100? Arabs. Arabs. And the Arabs had killed all the Africans in Tunisia in the 700s. Christians, Christians, Christians did not fight back against that. That's not true. They didn't That's fight. Not true. That's not true. Do you know when the do, do you know when the Crusades happened? The Crusades happened beginning in 1095 after the Turks conquered the Holy Land. I've already been asked questions. I'm I'm willing to answer. Well, there you have what we were talking about last week. Again, people don't even understand history. Again, this is a king who went and actually tried to, to liberate Africans who had been oppressed by their Arab rulers for centuries. But again, as you just heard, people are not interested in actual facts or debate. They just uh, shout and uh, get angry. Yep. So we uh, certainly commend Father Schumacher. And I, I if I didn't mention already, he was only ordained last May, May 2019, so he's a very young priest, so that is encouraging to see that uh, a young priest is willing to go out there and expose himself to the mob like that and, and try to speak the truth to them. Yes. And, uh, you know, God only knows what kind of um, the fruit that will be born from that, that good witness of his, but we hope that at least some of the people there might, uh, might actually take some time to reflect on what he was saying and, and uh, change their mind, change their ways. Mm -hmm. So the other, the other encouraging example we wanted to share with you all today involves the Archbishop of San Francisco, Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione, uh, and National Catholic Register had a good story uh, earlier this week, it was on Monday, the headline says, Archbishop performs exorcism where uh, St. Junipero Serra fell asking for God's mercy. And the article explains, on June 19th, the statue of St. Junipero Serra fell to angry protesters inside Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Uh, that, I believe that was a Friday. So on Saturday, the following day, Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione visited the park where St. Junipero once stood to offer prayers, perform an exorcism, and conduct other acts of reparation in response to what he called quote, horrendous acts of blasphemy. And this is another uh, quote from the Archbishop. He said, I've been feeling great distress and a deep wound in my soul when I see those horrendous acts of blasphemy and disparaging of the memory of Sarah, who was such a great hero, such a great defender of the indigenous people of this land, someone who was very much a part of my life growing up. I grew up very close to the first mission that he founded in San Diego. 
So it inflicted a very deep wound in my soul. Also earlier this week, in connection to this story, our friend and colleague, Dr. Taylor Marshall, recorded a great show with a, a Dr. Ed, Edmund Maza, who's a, a Catholic historian, and talking about the history of Father Sarah and all the good that he did in founding those missions and defending the rights and the dignity of the indigenous people, and most of all, obviously, uh, bringing them a knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and bringing them into the church through baptism. So I can, I'll can provide a link to that uh, in the, the uh, comments or the description section of this video. But uh, the Archbishop Cordelione is in very stark contrast to another uh, California bishop that I'll briefly mention before we move on to our next story. Uh, and this sparked a lot of controversy online on social media. Um, bishop Robert Barron, as viewers probably know, he was a uh, pretty well known even before becoming an auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, as known for his apostolate called Word on Fire. And he was get, apparently getting a lot of questions on social media uh, in the wake of the tearing down of the statue of, of uh, Father Junipero Serra, which happened, it was multiple statues. It wasn't just the one in um, San Francisco, if I understand correctly, there was another one in another part of the state, maybe even a third one. And people were asking him, you know, well, why aren't the bishops out there uh, defending the statues and, and facing the mob? And essentially, the, so he ended up, he engaged some people on social media, but eventually ended up writing an article, which is posted on his website, Word on Fire. And the headline says, why, what are the bishops doing about it is the wrong question. And essentially, the, the thesis of his article is this. My, this is his words, my purpose in this article is not to examine the specific issues surrounding Padre Serra, but rather to respond to a number of remarks in the com boxes that point to what I think is a real failure to understand a key teaching of Vatican II. And I have seen screenshots of, of comment responses of his on social media where he literally said to people, uh, essentially, it's not the bishop's job, it's the laity's job to be out in the public square defending those statues and essentially defending the, the public honor of our Lord and the faith. Just unbelievable. And of course, he points to Vatican II as his uh, pretext for that. Exactly. And this is just another rationalization came out of Vatican II for bishops to shirk their responsibility. So they hide behind collegiality, and now they hide behind not my job. Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, on a secular level, uh, President Truman had a famous sign on his desk. It said, the buck stops here, right? I know I'm at the top here, and I, whatever, even if I didn't do it, I'm responsible. Well, the bishop is the monarch of his diocese, and is responsible. The buck stops with him. And again, he certainly can enlist the assistance of lower clergy and the laity, but it is ultimately his responsibility, whatever happens in his diocese. Right. I mean, to use it's not a, surprising a, from this Bishop Barron. We reported on him, I think it was last, last year or 18 months ago. Yeah, he gave a very, very uh, scandalous, disappointing uh, interview yes. with um, ben, ben Shapiro, Shapiro. who's yeah. probably the most um, well-known, you know, practicing Jew, Jewish person in America now, a young man. Yes. And Bishop Barron had a golden opportunity to preach the gospel to him, and and. Shapiro asked him point blank, you know, do I need to accept Christ in order to be saved? And, and Barron essentially said, no, I have an and article. quoting Vatican II. And just, right, exactly. So again, his word's not really on fire there. Right, exactly. He referred to our Lord during that interview as the privileged way to salvation. Yes. Where, Which where is the in, Vatican II error, that they're sort of the uh, filet mignon and the chopped meat way. And, you know, right. it's not as great, but you still get nourished, right? You still get there. Uh, right. is, is, again, this another error promulgated by Vatican II. There's sort of two ways, the deluxe and the, the you know, first class and the, but, you know, you still get there. Right. Wow. Terrible. So, but, but again, uh, so sort of a mixed bag, as we always, you know, at least uh, we see these, these first two stories positive, and then this one with Bishop Barron, not surprisingly disappointing. Speaking of disappointments, uh, we return to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, we reported on their, you know, disappointing ruling, uh, you know, basically making up into a statute protections 
uh, on just you know choices of freedom to hire people that consistent with religious beliefs, making up these protections for uh, people who would practice lifestyles totally contrary to the church. Uh, you, you can't decide not to hire them because of that. We reported on that. Uh, now another blow from the Supreme Court. Uh, there was a Louisiana law which was uh, challenged. The Louisiana law said it didn't say you can't have an abortion. It just said that abortion providers for the safety of the women must have admitting privileges in a hospital within a certain radius of the clinic, uh, which is a very you know standard medical regulation of doctors who are practicing particularly in outpatient surgery centers um, that they. Uh, one, are certain competence by showing they can ad have admitting privileges, and two, if something goes wrong, they can admit the patient to a hospital directly. Um, that was enacted, was challenged uh, all, all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, uh, with the four liberal justices joined by Republican George Bush appointed John Roberts, the Chief Justice, voted to strike down the Louisiana law. Um, very, you know, this would have uh, uh, not only brought an end to uh, pretty much abortion, brought it to a very small number in Louisiana, but actually would have, uh, even for those who, who are committing the wrong of abortion, would have protected the lives of, of these women victims, uh, but struck down. And most dis disappointing, obviously, is Chief Justice John Roberts, but not only his vote, but what he wrote. He wrote the opinion, and his argument uh, is essentially this same law came up in Texas several years ago. So almost identical, a little different, but almost identical law. And the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional, citing Roe v. Wade and uh, Planned Parenthood v. Casey. A plurality decision. A plurality decision is when not a majority of the court can agree. They agree in the result. So five of them say overturn the law, but only four or fewer can agree on the reasons. So they actually don't have a majority explaining themselves. Um, uh, and, and those two are sort of bedrock of quote unquote abortion law, in the, which is really not law at all because it's against the natural law. But they basically decided under those precedents, the Texas law could not stand. Roberts dissented from that and said, this is wrongly decided. This is wrong. This, this regulation of providers should be allowed. But now he reversed himself 180 degrees and his logic is, well, that was totally wrong, but we got to stick with it. It's better. For, and he's very big on the integrity of the court. He says, oh, we have to respect the integrity of the court. Since they decided, we decided, even though I disagreed with it and said it was wrong, five people said we have to strike down the Texas law. We just have to stick with it. So again, this is the flaw of legal positivism. It's not rooted yes. in a natural law. That once we make a law, we have to stick with it for the sake of consistency, even if it's totally wrong. Well, by Chief Justice Roberts' argument, Dred Scott should still be the law in this country that says that African-Americans should remain slaves in the property of their landowner, of their own. Right. That uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, that uh, you can have segregation to segregate the races in public places should be the law because those were both Supreme Court precedents, but those were overturned. In Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court said Plessy versus Ferguson was wrongly decided. And rather than stick with a bad law that harms people, we are saying we, we are having the humility to say we made a mistake and reversed it. So again, Roberts, complete, complete uh, inconsistency, says it was wrong, says the law should stand, but we're just going to go along with the liberals. My guess is uh, he took a lot, and I think this was on purpose, uh, one of the other effects of those, those kangaroo court uh, impeachment hearings is that he was drawn into the political process a lot of heat, even though he really didn't do anything. He was sort of the weakest uh, 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 judge in the proceeding there, wouldn't make any decisions. Uh, he was put under a lot of heat, being told he was associated with Trump. He seemed very uncomfortable with it, has tried to distance himself. I think he did this personally as a way to distance himself from the president and say, oh, I'm, I'm different. I'm not like the current Republicans. Um, but for whatever reason, he voted, even though he did on different grounds and, and we didn't get a, a majority decision. Um, he vote, was the, the deciding vote to strike this law down. Um, positively, two positive things. Again, not very much because babies now are being killed in Louisiana that wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, two things. President Trump's two appointees to the court, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, voted to uphold the law. So they voted in a way consistent with natural and divine law that you, you certainly human law can put restrictions on uh, 
committing immoral acts, like committing an abortion. So they voted you know, the correct way under natural law, which is good to see that his two appointees, which means he has an opportunity to appoint a third that voted uh, to strike down this law. So uh, Ginsburg, Kagan, uh, um, uh, Souter, um, uh, obviously, or, um, oh, who am I forgetting, uh, Breyer. Uh, if, if, he, if one of those retired and President Trump appointed them, he seems to have a good track record. And we would have a different decision. And we have to take our hats off to, Chief, uh, to Justice Clarence Thomas, uh, who has just been an outstanding judge on the court. I remember they brutally tried, just like Kavanaugh, they tried to stop him uh, in the hearings that uh, Joe Biden presided over, actually, in the 90s, early, mm -hmm. tried to, to, to keep Clarence Thomas off the court. But he has been at a most consistent, even more consistent than Justice Anthony Scalia, I believe, uh, defense of truly proper principles of natural law. He eviscerated the court on this and clearly said that uh, there is no right to abortion in the Constitution. It was made up out of thin air and Roe v. Wade needs to be overturned. Just a beautifully written opinion is stating the truth, even though it has no legal effect because it was not supported by a majority. But he articulates and keeps alive the truth that just like Dred Scott, just like Plessy versus Ferguson will one day uh, hopefully come to be the opinion of the court. Uh, so those are signs of hope. I mean, Justice Thomas is getting you know up there in age. He won't be there for much longer, uh, but it does highlight whatever you think of President Trump, the most important impact he will have are these appointments of Supreme Court justices, as long as he has a Senate that will confirm them. So it's not just the president, you need a majority in the Senate. Uh, if he has one more term, he could solidify uh, the right people at the Supreme Court to protect the natural and divine law. Again, any other issue aside, uh, that for Catholics should be very important as we come up to the election. So I think- uh, yeah, the truth. Again, you know, important. Uh, oh, uh, one little final note on this, uh, the uh, on that story, which is again in, in encouraging. Um, after the decision was announced, uh, the the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, issued a statement about it. Uh, and this is from the uh, Catholic Bishops website, uh, which you know rightfully um, condemned the decision and said that. Uh, this was wrong, and the court's failure to recognize legitimacy of laws prioritizing women's health and safety over abortion business interests, pretty profit interests, constitutes a cruel precedent. So again, good, good, strong condemnation uh, of this decision by the bishop. So we can commend uh, them for that statement. Yes. So uh, kind of a, a flip side of this um, very disappointing defeat in the Supreme Court for for the rights of the unborn, we do have a victory to celebrate as well in the, the state of New York. Our friend and colleague Christopher Ferrara won a victory against uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. We have a post about this. Uh, Brian wrote a, a post about this last week Friday. Last week Friday was a busy day for us. Uh, had lots yeah, of literally, I think out. right after we recorded this, this opinion was announced. So it just it was, yes. News Roundup, which is why we posted about it. So I'll just read a little bit uh, to give viewers uh, an understanding of what happened. So as Brian explains in his post available on our website, attorney and internationally recognized author Christopher Ferrara obtained a preliminary injunction against New York Governor Andrew Cuomo his Attorney General Leticia James and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. Federal District Judge Gary L. Sharp issued a memorandum and order prohibiting Cuomo, James, and de Blasio, quote, excuse me, from ordering or enforcing COVID-19 prompted restrictions on outdoor religious worship gatherings, end quote. Because essentially, as the judge identified, uh, Cuomo and de Blasio were applying a, a gross double standard. They were basically persecuting uh, religious gatherings and saying you can't, you can't gather even outdoors uh, for mm -hmm. a religious service. And yet, you know, they're letting the, the looters, the rioters, the protesters um, do whatever they feel like, you know, packed like sardines in a can in the streets of New York City and elsewhere throughout the state. So obviously a, a terrible double standard and total hypocrisy on the part of those leaders. 
So as Brian uh, further explains, speaking of the hypocrisy, uh, the hypocrisy of the radically liberal Cuomo and de Blasio has finally been officially exposed. Judge Sharp chastised the liberal politicians for persecuting religious gatherings on the pretext of public health while commending and even joining mass outdoor protests, many of which resulted in looting and violence. Sharp blasted de Blasio's argument that his banning of even outdoor religious ceremonies was motivated by public safety concerns while lauding the mass protests. And I think there, I'm, Brian may have mentioned it in his article, but um, it was either Cuomo or de Blasio who said on, on during an, a press conference or something that was broadcast you know, on television that uh, basically there's no comparison between those who wanna gather for religious reasons and those who are out protesting 400 years of, of slavery and, uh, and persecute, you know, based racial persecution, basically. Mm. I, I don't recall the exact quote, but it's, it's truly outrageous that he would say such a thing. It, it really exposed his obvious bias against religious people. Which again, know. even a non-Catholic secular lawyer, if they were talking to him, would say, stop saying this. This is completely, I mean, it's just so blatantly against even the civil U.S. law, which makes clear under the U.S. Constitution that you have to be content neutral. You can't say if we have a law that people saying this message are allowed and these activities are not. That's just sort of basic law school first year, you know, legal knowledge. So he's right. at a natural level, he doesn't even seem to have any, you know, decent lawyer to tell him this is stupid what you're saying. Right. You say this. Like do it, maybe like, yeah, you're gonna say, maybe you're gonna do this, but don't tell everybody that's what you're doing. <laughs> right. So I'll just read briefly uh, this quote from uh, our friend Chris Ferrara in response to the, the good ruling of the judge. Uh, Chris Sham of Governor Cuomo's, quote, social distancing protocol, which went right out the window as soon as he and Mayor de Blasio saw a mass protest movement they favored taking to the streets by the thousands. Suddenly, the limit on mass gatherings was no longer necessary to save lives, yet they were continuing to ban high school graduations and other outdoor gatherings exceeding a mere 25 people. This decision is an important step toward inhibiting the, the suddenly emerging trend of exercising absolute monarchy on pretext of public health. With this kind of regime, uh, what this kind of regime really meant in practice is freedom for me, but not for thee. So we congratulate Chris and the legal team at the, the Thomas More Society for their good work in this case. And we hope that a similar uh, decision will be had in, in New Jersey, where Chris is also representing uh, Father Kevin Robinson of the Society of St. Pius X, and I believe a, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi or maybe a group of rabbis. I yes. haven't heard any updates about that case yet. That's still progressing. And, and that actually is an important point which you just mentioned, Father Robinson, uh, which is the conclusion of this story. Uh, the plaintiffs, the people that Chris was representing in both of these cases on the Catholic side, were not the diocese, who you think would be the bishop challenging this to get his diocese open. But as you heard, it was a, uh, a traditional priest, Father Kevin Robinson in New Jersey. And in New York, it was also two priests of the Society of St. Pius X, traditionalist priests. Yes. Uh, Stephen Seuss and Father Stamus, who were the plaintiffs, in each case joined by Orthodox rabbis or congregants in New York, people right. go to the uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, uh, temple. Or, so what's interesting about that is the entire, you know, quote unquote, official church that all the enemies of traditionalist priests say are in, quote, full communion. Uh, they were all in full communion by running away from this and not defending the rights of the church. They ran away from the foot of the cross. Uh, the, the only act of collegiality of the bishops found in the Bible when they all ran away. Right. St. John. Uh, they all are not involved, and it was left to these three traditionalist priests in New Jersey to defend the rights of the church. Then, when they win this victory for the church, did the bishops say, hey, thank you, congratulations for winning our freedom back? No, they don't. And in fact, our, our friend Dr. John Rao reported from New York uh, on the reaction of the New York bishops. I don't know if Matt wants to explain that. Yes, so uh, on Monday of this week, 
um, we published a very, it's a, it's a very brief article, but very hard hitting uh, from a New Yorker. Uh, he lives in, he and his family live in Greenwich Village, if I remember correctly. So he's, the headline really, really sums it up uh, perfectly. It says, snatching defeat from victory, chalk up another one for the conciliar church. And he explains in his, in his brief article, Chris Ferrara's victory in the case he represented against the city and state of New York was the first really happy moment I have experienced in these three and one half months of, of uh, Medico Media mayhem. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. <laughs> He's great with coming up with certain yes. phrases to describe um, things. <laughs> He says, so it's a, he's writing from a very personal uh, standpoint because as a New Yorker, he was ready to celebrate this victory. He says, I could not wait to enjoy that victory with my fellow traditionalists at mass the Sunday after the judge's decision. But once again, I was, as a friend frequently chastises me, surprised by the obvious. Why in heaven's name should I have thought that the bishops of the state of New York would be thrilled by Chris's victory and make proper use of it? Sure enough, they were not, and did not. 24 hours had not gone by before the following announcement was published, and this was in a report published by the Catholic News Agency, quote, the New York State uh, Catholic Conference, which represents the bishops of the state, told CNA on Friday that churches would probably continue to follow state health guidelines for reopening, even though they are no longer bound by law to do so unbelievable. So this is what uh, uh, Professor Rao says in response. The only thing that seems not to have been accurate in that statement was the word probably. It was, def <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely true. Our noble prelates, and being sarcastic obviously with the noble part, had snatched defeat from victory. So yeah, they want to show themselves. We've done a lot of reporting on the church in China and the capitulations of the communists there. They want to show that the American hierarchy is just like the patriotic church in China, good little subjects of the secular authority, that the church has been subjugated to the state. So even when the rights of the church are vindicated, we're going to, we, the bishops, are going to go against those rights of God uh, in favor of showing ourselves to be good little secularists, and we're going to uh, keep our churches essentially shut down. I mean, they are, they've shown the total submission of the church to the state. I think it also shows the damn, like the, just so folks understand, well, what is the, the New York State Catholic Conference of Bishops? It's basically like a microcosm within a state of collegiality. Mm -hmm. So again, it's usurping the individual rights and duties of the individual ordinary of a diocese. So bishops nowadays, I mean, even those who might want to stand up, they feel they're bound almost by this, this spirit of collectivism, that if I don't act with the collective mindset, then I'm going to be ostracized or persecuted or, or what have you. So it's, it's yes. another rotten fruit of the collegiality of the, of the council, basically. Again, the abdication of fatherhood, the abdication of authority, uh, and just another excuse for it. Speaking of collegiality. <laughs> yeah, speaking of collegiality, we were very brief update on the Amazon Synod and its aftermath. Uh, it was announced this week uh, in a Vatican uh, uh, news press release where we saw this announced that CELOM uh, announces new ecclesial conference of the Amazon region. So uh, this was something that was a proposal in the final a document for the Amazon Synod last year in its fall of 2019, which the Pope favorably talked about in his closing remarks, that in addition to the uh, individual national conferences in Latin American, South American countries, right. and in addition to the Latin American Bishops Conference, we need yet another conference of the Amazon, of all the bishops that across various countries are quote unquote considered in the Amazon, they need their own collective conference. Uh, of the Amazon. And again, that's what has now been announced that they, this uh, Politburo that got together, uh, voted to approve the name, Conference in the Amazon, and their um, uh, rules and, and statutes to govern them uh, with the involvement of uh, Vatican officials. Uh, not a lot said about what this thing's going to do, but my bet is no good, uh, given, right. <laughs> number one, what came out of the Amazon Synod, and number two, the president that they appeared to be unanimously elected, uh, Cardinal Humez, 
uh, who was the uh, uh, representative from REPAM, which again is this, it, it, the uh, acronym is, comes from Spanish, so it doesn't matter to English. But yeah, I think in English it's roughly translated the Pan Amazonian Ecclesial Network, something like that. Exactly, the party, we can just call right. it. Right. <laughs> uh, that was a driving force behind the Amazon Synod. Uh, and specifically the Pachamama idolatry, yes. Particularly, this Humez. Uh, was the one who really orchestrated and implemented the Pacamama idolatrous sacrilege that occurred in Rome. Uh, he is the president. So from that appointment alone, we know which direction this thing is going. Uh, yet, yet again, another thing we'll have to watch and report on in the future, but probably nothing good coming out of it. Again, clearly with the blessing and approval, they make point pointedly clear of the Vatican and Pope Francis. Yes. So again, Quirita Amazonia did not end anything. It just continued to facilitate these... Uh, these further uh, destructions of the church. Right, and if I could make a, a small prediction, my guess is that part of the purpose of this new ecclesial conference, I think I saw this mentioned in a couple of different reports, is that it's meant to implement the, you know, to make sure that the church has an Amazonian face, whatever that yes. means. So most likely it's going to lead to the enculturation, meaning the paganization of the church in that area of the world and perhaps even beyond. We'll see what happens. Yes. So our final story today, we need to return to our our good Archbishop and hero Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano because His Excellency is, is starting to come under fire for his uh, strong stance against Vatican II and we have a couple of uh, stories to share with you in that regard. So the first one, I, there's been a string of articles published um, throughout this past week that uh, should be mentioned. So I guess actually the first one was published last week, Friday, June 26th at LifeSite News. And it's an opinion piece by a Catholic professor. His name is... Professor uh, John Paul Meenan. Yeah, Professor John Paul Meenan, and he is apparently a professor of theology and natural science and a founding member at Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College in Barry's Bay, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And so the headline for his opinion piece says, Catholic Prof, uh, Archbishop Vigano is right in calling for reform, but church cannot simply repudiate Vatican II. And I think that's, the, that's what's really getting uh, Archbishop Vigano into some hot water with a lot of people is his call for just the complete you know, let it drop and be forgotten, as we've reported. Yes. Yes. That's what's getting him into uh, drawing this fire from lots of different areas in the church. And also, which we highlighted in our report, uh, his repudiation of Benedict XVI's reform in the hermeneutic of con of con Yes. Yes. That's yes. what Sandro oh, Magister, yes. Yes, Sandro Magister went after in his critique defending Benedict. And again, this is uh, really great humility on the part of Archbishop Vigano, who was appointed uh, and, and worked closely with Benedict XVI, and basically says, I bought the hermeneutic of continuity, and has now said it's failed. He says in his, uh, his June statements that the hermeneutic of continuity has utterly failed. You can't prove it. Uh, it is not just saying it's in continuity doesn't make it so. Right. And Magister goes after him, you know, violently saying, no, Benedict XVI has the answer. And it's really important to emphasize the error in Benedict XVI's thought that, that Magister defends. Because again, John Venari spoke about this a lot. CFN's published about it. But this is the way Benedict XVI understands continuity. It is not an objective continuity. So the continuity of tradition is everyone who's been in the church says the same thing. So the thing that is con continuity is the objective truth that's being taught. So St. Irenaeus, St. Peter, Pope Pius V, everyone through history, are the, the continuity is they're saying the same thing. It's called right. an objective continuity. Uh, whereas what Benedict XVI says, and Sandra Magister mentions this a lot, it is the continuity of the subject church, meaning that it's the same person speaking, even though they're saying different things. But the continuity is, is that it's the same church throughout history that is speaking, even what it's saying, even what it's saying is different. So in, in essence, it's a violation of what Vatican I taught in Dei Filius, that yes. it must be in the same sense and the same meaning. 
That's, As and that's what taught. That's yes. what St. Pius X prescribed in the oath against modernism, which is so crucial that it, you can't just use the same words, but give them different meanings, or you can't use different words, but claim they mean the same thing. It has to be the same sense and the same meaning. And again, Benedict XVI doesn't say they have to mean the same thing. He just says, as long as it's the same church, right. then you have continuity in the subject, right? Right. not in the object. And that's what's critical, because that is the modern approach that Pius X condemned, right? Yes. And the, among, among other things, and the, in the anti-modern so, And again, as you know, the credit we've given to Benedict XVI for the few good things he did to hold at bay the most extreme parts of the revolution, this part of his thinking is fundamentally what Archbishop Vigano is attacking and what is sustained the revolution in the church. That we can change what the church teaches as long as we don't leave the church. And this is why this whole idea of, of uh, uh, communion, partial communion, is important to them is that as long as it's the same people, we can change everything they say, and we have continuity. The example that the Register doesn't uh, refer to, but which Benedict XVI used, is a river. So you can have different water flowing through the river. As long as it's following the same course, it's the same river, is the example. So you can sort of take away all the water, put different water in, and as long as it follows the same course, it's the same river. This is extremely dangerous, and this is what Vigano is pointing out that no, the test of continuity is the objective truth, not that popes are saying or that bishops are saying it or that the church is, is apparently saying it. Uh, and that, that's very, very important. And Magister went right after this in his, his attack. Um, and as I understand from, from those who know him personally, it's, it's un, he's uncharacteristically riled up about this. He's very, you know, he's, he's yes. writing in a very kind of angry defensive tone, which is not necessarily characteristic so it's really hit a nerve with him apparently very much so and it's something i wanted to mention from uh, professor meenan's opinion piece published by lifesite which really stuck out to me as needing definitely needing a response uh, professor meenan wrote quote no council is perfect <laughs> and some more imperfect than others but all councils ratified by the pope become part of the ordinary magisterium, and we must take what is good while clarifying and purifying what is not so. No council Two is... Two problems with that. <laughs> right? Number one is the ordinary magisterium's test, as St. Vincent tells us, is it is said always, everywhere, and by everyone. Right. So that's the ordinary, that's how you find the ordinary magisterium. The extraordinary magisterium is when the Pope says it, right, in, under certain conditions. So he's blurring this distinction. He's saying, well, when the Pope approves the council, it's part of the ordinary magisterium, wrong. What makes it part of the ordinary magisterium is its continuity through time and space. Everyone everywhere saying the same thing, not just the Pope approved it. Yes. Uh, number two, this is his other excuse that they try to say, and again, the defenders of the council who want to salvage it, oh, but there's beautiful good things. Well, without really citing them. Okay, where is the good fruit that came out of Vatican II? Every time they try that, it falls apart, and they just try to defer attention from the errors and ambiguities that have hurt the faith and say, oh, but we don't want to get rid of these great good things. Compared to the harm they've done, where is the good, right? Where is it? Uh, and again, the analogy that has been bandered about by some of this debate of the cake, right? Archbishop Vigano talks about the poison cake, right? It has poison in it. You don't want to eat the cake. We well, don't say, oh, we don't want to throw the cake out, you know, because of the poison, because there's some beautiful Giardelli chocolate in that cake. <laughs> Giardelli chocolate, even though eating the chocolate mixed with the poison will kill us, right? That, that, that is the, you know, the response to that, oh, we, there's beautiful things in Vatican II. Right, another um, kind of more veiled critique, it kind of, this is from uh, J.D. Flynn at Catholic News Agency, which offered a, a so-called analysis piece uh, which headline says, as Archbishop Vigano denounces Vatican II, the Vatican is not speaking, but it's really kind of a veiled uh, affront against the Archbishop. He says, uh, J.D. Flynn says in his article, let's see here, uh, his interview and his other recent comments on Vatican II, referring to Vigano, made arguments familiar to anyone who has spent time among adherents of the Society of St. Pius X, or other traditionalist groups outside the full communion of the church. <laughs> and he goes on to say that the council's decrees on religious liberty and interreligious dialogue reject Catholic doctrine, 
that as a pastoral council, Vatican II does not bind Catholics, that the council has led to the infiltration of the enemy into the heart of the church. He goes on to, J.D. Flynn at CNA goes on to say, those arguments have been addressed and critiqued repeatedly by theologians and historians, including Benedict XVI, and in the mind of the church's hierarchy, have been sufficiently refuted. Well, no, they've been barely asserted, but not actually demonstrated. That's the problem. Exactly. Professor Roberto de Mattei, a, a renowned church historian, has written a book, The Second Vatican Council, An Unwritten Story, which most likely Archbishop Vigano has read because a lot of his arguments seem to be coming from that source, or a lot of the source material anyway. Um, he and a group of, of uh, 49 fellow Italian theologians and scholars petitioned Pope Benedict in 2011 for a, a total re-examination of Vatican II in light of tradition and asked for an actual scientific demonstration of what you mentioned earlier, objective continuity of the council with tradition. And they, gave, they asked for very specific demonstrations of you know, how is religious liberty in objective continuity with what the, the pre-Vatican II popes taught? And guess what? They were summarily ignored by Benedict XVI. They never got an answer to that petition. And I would assume the answer is that it cannot be demonstrated that there's objective Well, and again, continuity. by their own admissions, that's true. I think it was Meenan's uh, own admission. He says, oh, yes, Digitatis Humani is a contradiction, is a rupture. But he says, it's oh, it's only a rupture with the 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 line of popes that came right before it. This is their argument. Oh, it is a rupture with that, but that was a rupture, and we're really just getting back to the ancient church. And he said, because in the ancient church, the martyrs died for freedom of religion. These are the same martyrs that cast down idols. They yep. didn't seem to be that big in terms of freedom of religion, right? Saint Agnes, who who just you know knocked down a, an idol. They this is again another one of their ploys. They, they first say there's no rupture, it's in continuity. Then they say, well, there is a rupture, but it's really a rupture, restoring a rupture that had existed in the church for 1,800 years, uh, because we're going back to the ancient church that actually believed in Digitatis Humani, which St. Irenaeus, to take an example, would be appalled at what Digis, Digitatis Humani says uh, very clearly. So another la so, last actually point on what you read, I do want to follow up on it, I think is interesting. Um, he points out, as you read, that the Vatican has not responded. The Vigano has been remained silent. That word, remember, when Archbishop Vigano first emerged on the scene and accused Pope Francis of covering up for McCarrick, the only response Pope Francis gave is, I will remain silent. I, I will not say one word on this. Yep. I will not say one word on this. Now, why is that? It only can lead me to speculate that Archbishop Vigano knows something he has not revealed. He has some information even beyond what we know particularly about pope francis and his past because why else this pope who is willing to eviscerate and attack anybody who goes against him look at cardinal burke i do anything to them why in the case of vegan is he always in silence he makes these very strong accusations against pope francis and francis uh, unique among all of his critics so i won't address that one there's something we don't know again i'm only speculating but right. to me, it says there's something Archbishop Vigano knows that is giving him uh, that Pope Francis is afraid of. Because why else would he not? I seem to recall, you know, maybe it was at least a year ago, maybe even longer than that, that Archbishop Vigano may, I'd have to do the, the research to refresh my memory, but I think I remember reading that Vigano said, you know, I have a, a cache C, you know, C-A-C-H-E cache of documents, mm -hmm. like a collection of documents that if, they, if someone were to try and assassinate me, basically, wow. that's why he went into hiding, that, that those documents would be made public. So it was kind of, I think, I'm pretty sure I remember that uh, being mm -hmm. reported somewhere in the news. So you could be right about that speculation. Yes. Uh, so we we're, we're want to end this story on a positive note because uh, our friend and colleague and our contributor, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, has written a, a really a brilliant response to these sorts of attacks which was, was published on Monday of this week at 1 Peter 5. And the headline says, Why Vigano's Critique of the Council Must Be Taken Seriously. So I'll provide a link to this article in the uh, description of this video and so really encourage folks to go read that because um, he just, he sums it up so well. Um, we don't have time. We're kind of running out of time to go over a lot of the details of it, but I'll just say, 
um, provide a couple of quotes here. He says, I have studied and taught the documents of the council, some of them numerous times. I know them very well. Since I am a great books devotee and have always taught for great books schools, my theology courses would typically begin with scripture and the fathers, then go into the scholastics, especially St. Thomas, and finish up with magisterial texts, namely papal encyclicals and conciliar documents. This is from uh, Dr. Kwasniewski's article. He says, I often felt a sinking of the heart when the course reached a Vatican II document, you know, when he's teaching at a, a mainstream school, such as Lumen Gentium, Sacra Sanctum Concilium, Dignitatis Humanae, Unitatis Redintegratio, etc. Of course, of course, they have much that is beautiful and orthodox in them. They would never have gotten the requisite number of votes that they had they been flagrantly opposed to Catholic teaching. However, they are also sprawling, unwieldy, consist inconsistent committee products, which needlessly complicate many subjects and lack the crystalline clarity that a council is supposed to work hard to achieve. And I think that's, and he also provides a an perfect quote regarding the cake analogy from uh, an encyclical Satis Cogitum by Pope Leo XIII, which says, the Arians, the Montanus, the Novatians, the Quattrodecimans, the Eutychians certainly did not reject all Catholic doctrine. They abandoned only a certain portion of it. Still, who does not know that they were declared heretics and banished from the bosom of the church? This is Leo XIII. In like manner were condemned all authors of heretical tenets who followed them in subsequent ages. There can be nothing more dangerous than those heretics who admit nearly the whole cycle of doctrine, and yet by one word, as with a drop of poison, infect the real and simple faith taught by our Lord and handed down by apostolic tradition. Mm. There it is, right there. Yes, and definitely commend Dr. Hanuski's article uh, to read in full. It's a, if you've been confused by the attacks on Archbishop Vigano, it's an excellent source. Yes. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our stories for this week. We thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Hit the little notifications bell button so that you're notified when new content is available. And it's also very, very helpful if you please share this video on social media, share it on Facebook, Twitter with your family and friends to help us uh, spread it around, spread the word. And then uh, if you appreciate and enjoy this free content that we make available on our YouTube channel and our website. We do ask for your support in the form of a subscription to our monthly publication, Catholic Family News. Uh, we're able to offer still the, the e-edition only option, uh, still having some issues with trying to get our, our office reopened and, and all of that related to, to COVID restrictions. But we definitely do ask for your, uh, for your subscriptions to the e-edition. And again, the e-edition, you can sign up online. You have instant access to the current month plus back issues for about the past two years right there within seconds of signing up. So um, you certainly can take advantage of that for, you know, roughly not, less than $2 a month. You can have access to all the back issues and get it every month on the first of the month as soon as it's published before it's even printed. Uh, so again, that's uh, less than $2 a month. You can do that and yes. support us as well. Yes, and in these difficult times, we're, we're very uh, appreciative of your subscriptions, and maybe you could even subscribe, uh, purchase a, subs a gift subscription for a family member or a friend. Really helps us uh, keep the presses rolling and, and be able to keep producing this content. Yes. yes. So in closing, as we always do, we will pray together a Hail Mary and, and entrust ourselves, our families and friends, and all of our work to Jesus through Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Uh, Saint Irenaeus. Pray for pray us. For Holy Apostles Peter and Paul. Pray for pray us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Have a good we week. Wish, yes, we wish everyone a, a happy and safe 4th of July weekend for those watching in the U.S.
Ich bin nicht